Good evening, everybody. We are excited to have all of you joining us this evening for um, a discussion on Mystery Quilt and uh, a wonderful artist to talk with, with a bunch of our participating artists in, in this particular exhibition. Um, we also have a really exciting workshop that's going to be happening after this portion of the discussion that we're um, looking forward to folks participating in. Um, but I just wanted to take a minute before we, we get started to welcome you all to um, the call tonight. My name is Tony Brunswick, and I proudly serve as the executive director for Art Nables. Um, for those that may be new to Art Nables and our work, we are an art gallery, an art studio um, that's celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Um, we were founded in 20, uh, 2001. Um, and our mission then is our mission now. Uh, we are committed to creating opportunities for adult visual artists with disabilities to be able to make market and earn income from their artwork. So we operate a big, beautiful studio and gallery where uh, during non-COVID times and we're slowly returning, we have artists uh, creating and making artwork. Um, and then we also have a beautiful exhibition space here where we program exhibitions throughout the year. Uh, and we hope for those that haven't had a chance to visit us in person uh, that you have the opportunity to do so at some point in the future. Um, we have slowly started to reopen post COVID or as we start emerging from COVID and our public gallery hours are Saturdays from nine to 5 p.m. and Thursday evenings from five to seven. So we'd love to have you come by. Uh, and if you can't join us then uh, all of our information is available online and our galleries, are, uh, our exhibitions are available for viewing. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Marissa. Thank you again for participating. Thank you to our exhibiting artists for being a part of the show and for being a part of uh, our conversation this evening. We're, we're really honored and grateful to be working with all of you. Great, thank you, Tony. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here uh, to take a look at Mystery Quilts one of our three current exhibitions at Art Nables. Um, like Tony said, we're really glad to be able to share the exhibition with everybody virtually, especially for those that are out of town, but we'd really love for you to come see us in person if you're able. And I think it's a very rewarding show to, to see in person. Um, I really love the show and I'm gonna start by reading the exhibition description as uh, just a little introduction. So in the world of quilting, a mystery quilt is a method of quilt making in which instructions and clues are given one by one over a period of time without the quilter knowing what the final result will be. Undertaken as a group activity, the process can yield a variety of final designs as each quilter interprets the instructions differently. While none of the works in this exhibition are literal quilts or even textiles, the artists employ familiar quilt-like qualities in their own material languages of painting, drawing, and collage. In these works, colorful geometries are assembled, balanced, bound, pieced, clustered, and contained. Shapes are intimately joined by shared borders, each piece a necessary keystone supporting the rest. Um, these congregations create varying degrees of order and chaos. In places, works mimic traditional quilts, smartly self-modulating their patterns in gridded structures. In others, shapes misbehave, are amorphous, overlapping, transparent, gelatinous, and shifting. They bend, swirl, drip, and break open in unexpected windows. 
these quilts seduced with dynamic abstraction, each collection of elements offering new systems of self-contained logic and playful ideologies. Um, Art in Naples believes in a diverse and inclusive landscape, artistic landscape in which artists both with and without disabilities exhibit side by side. We're pleased to include work in this exhibition by four Art in Naples resident artists and artists from Creative Growth in Oakland, California, Make Studio in Baltimore, Maryland, and the Kennedy Center's Maggie Daly Arts Cooperative in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And so um, the exhibition title is a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, like I mentioned, none of the works in the show are actually quilts um, and many of them were made not with quilts even in mind, but I really like looking at the works through that kind of lens and seeing the common um, thread, if you will, of these colorful shapes assembled in some way in all of the works. And then also seeing um, how they kind of misbehave as quilts when viewed in that context, or at least uh, misbehave as a traditional American quilts, at least. Um, I think there are also interesting ties between the idea of the mystery quilt and the artistic process in general. The idea of not having a clear roadmap necessarily of how something is going to turn out, but instead pulling things in piece by piece and continuing to respond and build and react as things come. This is uh, such an exciting group of artists we have in Mystery Quilt, and we unfortunately won't have time to go really in depth with each of them tonight, but we will be hearing from a number of them for just a couple minutes at a time. If you have questions or comments, uh, please do put them in the chat or actually ideally in the Q&A and um, we'll be getting to them as we can. And if you do have a question, go ahead and just drop it in the, the Q&A right away because we will be moving fairly quickly. Um, and then when we've heard from all of the artists tonight, we'll be transitioning over to the workshop portion of our event in which one of our artists, Mark Michaela, will be demonstrating some ways to make quilt inspired compositions using found materials. So we'd love for you to participate if you like using anything you have on hand that can be cut up and rearranged. So if you'd like grab a pair of scissors, a magazine page, um, a newspaper, anything graphic that can be cut into different component parts. Okay, and I'm excited to introduce our first artist of the evening. Scrolling through these here, Joseph Aleph. Joseph makes active paintings that radiate with energy. Blending an impressive array of colors with gestural and drip elements, Aleph has created his own expressive visual language. Often beginning with delicate fields of color, he then integrates linear and distinct graphic elements that form sculptural effects. He has been a studio artist at Creative Growth since 2001 and devotes most of his time to painting, though he has also explored ceramics as well. So Joseph, we're really glad to have you here. Uh, what would you like to tell us about your work? Name is Joseph Aleph. I am 40 years old and live in Berkeley, California with my cute dog, Ollie. I started doing painting, drawing, and ceramics in high school with my art teacher, Sally Wolfer. She helped me find my creative talent and introduced me to creative growth. I have been making art at Creative Growth ever since. Painting is my favorite form of art. I, got, I get inspired by colors and things in my environment and translate those things into abstract paintings. I like to mix different mediums in my work. After I paint a I picture, I, go, I will go over it with markers and ink and to make it stronger and add texture. I feel very lucky to have found creative growth because it is a wonderful place where I get to learn and grow my art practice with good teachers and friends. I also feel very proud because CG has given me an opportunity to sell my artwork and have many people see it in the gallery shows. Thank you. Thank you very much. It has been an honor to talk to you today. Thank you so much, Joseph. Your work is incredible. And um, I've seen on social media that you're working on some really large scale pieces right now too that are like, I don't know, they look like the size of the entire wall that's in front of me. That's really exciting. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we will move on to our next artist. 
Aziza Claudia Gibson Hunter was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She received her BS from Temple University and her MFA in printmaking from Howard University. She's exhibited in the US and abroad and her work is included in the permanent collections of the Liberian Embassy, ISCI, the District of Columbia, as well as the Montgomery County Works on Paper Collection. Ms. Gibson Hunter's residencies have included the Haystack School of Art, the Vermont Studio Center and Pyramid Atlantic. Her fellowships include the Distinguished DC Commission of the Arts and Humanities Individual Fellowship in 2006, 2016, 2018, and 2020. And in 2019, she was a Denbo Fellow at Pyramid Atlantic. She has a studio in Washington, DC. Aziza, welcome. I'd love to hear more about your work. I love that this piece is one of the few in the show that does not adhere to the kind of frame of the rectangle. I'd love to hear more about your process and what's behind this Potentia series. Sure. Well, as a child, potential was a word used by elderly Black women in my neighborhood. It provided a language for an energy for, for vigorously appreciated in my community, for it was an appealing attribute to be discovered in both children and adults. This energy was a promise that moved across past, present, and future. Potential was the promise of action, good character, and an unyielding force that pushed out from the person tenaciously, without boundary, beyond limitations, at, away from, it, it, it pushed beyond the body and it exuded cap cap capacity. Our community could feel it and we could see it. And facing the most challenging obstacles, this energy showed itself to those who had the courage to tap into it. So utilizing layers of color, pattern, texture, and gesture, I employ abstraction to give form to this dynamic energy. My matrix is paper because it breathes, is pliable, absorbent, and be can, can be cut and torn. A range of acrylic mediums are manipulated to create vibrant and juxtaposed textures and colors that vibrate with the rhythms and patterns. This series is a chronicled uh, visual archive of thoughts and meditations on the concept of potential, which is the potential energy of the human being. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aziza. And I, I feel like I remember reading your statement. Um, it sounded like your process, it, it were, was one of the statements that kind of reminded me a little bit of quilting or the quilting process, just in terms of all the pieces that you're pulling in. Did you ever think about quilting when you're making your pieces or do you relate to that at all? I relate to it very much so. Um, because in the beginning, it's a certain kind, type of gathering that goes on where I create all these different papers. Um, I, some of the papers I actually make from scratch. And then some oh. I uh, actually paint, I print into them, I draw into them. And there's a big pile of them in the center of my studio. And then I pull these together to do, to create these pieces. And that you observe that they do not, they do not work inside of a, traditional rectangle or square, because I really do hold on to this concept of boundlessness, this pushing out. I expect a lot from human beings. I think we can be so much more than what we are. And I, I uh, express that through these uh, pieces that push out from the center. I love that. That's awesome. And um, it's hard to see in this picture, but um, in addition to you know the shape not adhering to a rectangle, there are pieces in it like this. These pieces here that stand up and have dimension um, they out into space. They actually crawl out of the piece. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Was there anything else you wanted to share with us? No, I think I pretty much said what I needed to say. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank um, you. In that case, we'll move on to our next artist, Molly Hauser. Molly is an artist with the Maggie Daly Arts Cooperative in Connecticut, which is an initiative through the Kennedy Center. She's been practicing at MDAC since July of 2014. 
Molly creates bright and colorful worlds in her art, usually using markers. Her meticulous style of drawing involves weaving together a scene or landscape through small squares of color. Molly has had three solo shows and has had her art displayed at the Kirshner Art Gallery in Fairfield, Connecticut numerous times, along with exhibitions at various town halls and the Kennedy Art Gala in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Besides visual art, Molly is, an accompli is accomplished when it comes to creative writing, theater, and yoga. She often writes stories to accompany her art pieces, which is so cool. And Molly, I know you have some comments prepared that you'd like to share. Yeah, um, yes, I do. Um, these artworks, um, I, I use different colors to create a pattern, a pattern so I can use different techniques and how I, I, and I used oil pastels and my, and my magic markers to create uh, small squares so I can follow the, that quilt. When, when I create that, it makes you. It makes me feel good about what kind of images that I, that I use in my um in my um in my um in my system. You know, I, I like to um experience different worlds to make it more fun, like like Disney movies and landscapes. That's awesome. I love the technique that you use, Molly. It's, it seems like it's a lot of work to build your compositions with all of these tiny squares. They're so intricate and it really kind of feels like they're woven. It has such a dimension to it. Yeah, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good about that. That's awesome. And um, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I read that you you like to have stories that accompany your work sometimes. Do you have a story in particular, maybe for this moon magic piece? Anything you want to share about that that piece? Well, that piece, when I think about magic, I think about Disney and how it relates to Cinderella and um, the unicorns. It reminds me of the magic of, of them all. It just, it, it makes you want to feel good about it makes you want to feel great about that. Yeah, this piece, it does feel really magical. I don't know if, um, for me, this little panel on the right is blocking part of it, but there's like this, these little dots of rays of moonlight coming down on this scene, which I think is really well, cool. Well, that's magic. That's magic. That's what it feels like. It yes. feels like magic. That's awesome. Is there anything else you want to tell us about your work? And, and the other piece that, that I've been doing it, it is like we, um, connect with each other, connect with each other, and it, it makes you want to feel energy. It makes me want to feel experience the whole new world. Yeah, that's awesome. Your work, your works have a lot of really interesting settings and and uh, different worlds in them. That definitely comes across. Well, thank you so much. Anything else before we move on? That's it. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you, Molly. Okay, next up we have Charles Philippe Jean-Pierre, who is a Haitian American artist raised on Chicago's South Side. He is currently an adjunct professor at American University in Fine Arts. As a US State Department Art and Embassies artist, his work is now in the permanent collection of the US Embassy in Cotonou, Benin, West Africa. He was a President Obama White House invitee for the role of art education in promoting national youth justice. Jean-Pierre has participated in two Asian Pacific American Smithsonian exhibitions and has exhibited with the International Monetary Fund headquarters in Washington, DC. His work has been highlighted by numerous media outlets, including the Washington Post, Ebony Magazine, Black Enterprise, NHK Japan, The Village Voice, BET, NBC, Netflix, and Fox. He holds a Master's of Arts from Howard University and has created public art murals in South Africa, Panama, New York, Chicago, Washington, Istanbul, Montreal, Port-au-Prince, London, and Paris. So Charles, welcome. Um, you have such a, a prolific practice and you don't always work in this abstract way, but you have several series of these um, abstract pieces that are made up of all of these modular designs that are really engaging. Um, what would you like to tell us about this series or your piece? Um... Thank you for the great introduction. I'm happy to be here. Um, I started making these pieces with my father who happens to be um, an adult with um, disabilities. He's 90% uh, deaf 
um, in one ear, 60 in the other, but he has uh, Parkinson's now, which is a, a degenerative disease. Um, and I started making these um, fabrics with him um, as art therapy. And um, a, he would work alongside me. And then I started looking at his work and seeing images and pieces. And I wanted to uh, piece those images together to tell stories, to tell my family's story, uh, and then tell my story as a people, our story as a people. Um, within this last year, I've been uh, contemplating blackness a lot and thinking about the universe. And there's a quote uh, from the ocean and it says, what did the ocean say to the black boy? And the ocean says, um, they call me blue because they don't understand the sky. They call you black because they don't understand the universe. And um, that made me wonder and think and explore the universe a lot more. So I created these celestial bodies that represent us. Um, the most that we know about the quote unquote universe are like our um, zodiac signs. So I'm a Gemini, birthday's coming up pretty soon. But I wanted to re represent us as a as not as people of color or in a color, but as beings that come from the stars. And that's what I've been expressing here uh, with this piece. That's beautiful. I didn't know or all these of that. pieces. Yeah, you have a whole series. <laughs> um, you have a whole series like this, right? Yeah, so half of the series are called uh, Celestial Bodies. They're figurative works. And the other half are uh, entitled portals. And these are portals, uh, I believe that our mothers or our parents uh, kind of project us into this world and it takes nine months for us to get here. And I wanted to show that um, we are of the universe and the universe is, is uh, of us. So um, we're sentient beings, we're conscious, we understand. Um, that um, the universe is vast, but if there was no one in the universe to even acknowledge the universe, would the universe exist? Um, so I'm just uh, reflecting that light through these works. I love that. And um, this piece has um, more of like a, an organic, um, a soft edge, loopy kind of quality to it, but you also have some series of works that are very um, they're more geometric. structured feeling, more geometric, like squares and, and lines that form these squares. Were you thinking of quilts at all with any of those pieces? Um, in, in, the, in the abstract theoretical sense, I definitely uh, weave things together and look at them as uh, quilts. Uh, this was my first exploration in, in using organic shapes um, that over, overlap and interlay. Um, with each other. Uh, I'm planning on exhibiting this greater series in South Africa, and I wanted to try something new and bring something unique. And so I'm happy to participate in this exhibition and give you give the world a sneak peek of what's to come. Yeah, thank you. We're happy to have you. Um, great. Is there anything else um, you'd like to share? Uh, I love Arts and Nables and Go Howard University. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Charles. And um, I'm noticing we're not really getting many uh, questions in the chat or the Q&A, which is totally fine. But please do feel free to, to pop stuff in there if you have a question or just a thought you want to share. Um, and maybe we can also come back for some others at the end, too. Okay, great. Thanks again, Charles. Uh, next up, we have Mariah Ann Johnson, who's the native of Little Rock, Arkansas, and currently lives in Los Angeles. She explores the physical realities of bodily experience and art making in the landscape through drawing, movement, and site-specific installation. She focused on art and literature at Rice University and earned her MFA from the University of Illinois in 2006. Mariah's paintings and installations have been exhibited in solo and group shows around the country, from Los Angeles to New York, Houston, Chicago, and Washington, D.C., where she lived and worked from 2009 until 2018. From 2011 to 2018, Mariah was a lecturer in painting and drawing at the George Washington University. She has performed with Haley Cutler's Darling Dance Company and undertaken several international artist residencies. Um, 
I really love this piece, uh, Mariah, and it's exciting. It's the only piece in the show that is suspended from the ceiling and which has a back and a front that you can actually walk around and, and see both sides. Um, Mariah, what can you share with us about this work? Hi, everybody. Um, I really appreciate being included in this exhibition. Um, even though I, I still hold uh, Washington, D.C. really close to my heart, I'm not there anymore. So it's really great to have my work uh, there for me. Um, uh, this work grew out of a large piece of paper I had that I made a failed drawing performance on. And uh, that was a really important failure because it I was, I've been creeping into the realm of performance for a bit. And um, it's really important to have those failures or things that don't work like you think they should and be able to take that and learn from it. Anyway, I had this large sheet of paper. It had these marks all over it. And um, paper is so wonderful. I just wanna echo something Aziza said about it being absorbent and malleable and you can change it instantly. And uh, I think that's why I go back to it again and again. Anyway, I cut, I cut up this large sheet of paper just sort of in a crazy fit. And over the last maybe two years, I've been collecting imagery from the neighborhood I live in in Los Angeles, uh, particularly during these pandemic times. My family and I have been taking a couple walks every day. So I try to remember little bits and pieces of what I see around the neighborhood and come back to my studio and try to paint or draw or render somehow um, something of what has stuck in my head. Uh, this piece has two sides because when you mark on paper, often something appears on the back. I've always been fascinated with that as an art maker and never really knew how to activate it until pretty recently, which is seems clear now, just mark on both sides and um, let the audience decide. Um, so anyway, even though this piece is abstract, it's really grounded in everyday experience and everyday imagery, um, just filtered through my memory and what my hands can and can't do. Awesome. And um, I personally feel really proud of having assembled this piece in the, the studio because um, it was sent here from Los Angeles. But um, do you... Um, I was wondering when putting this together, do you kind of just make a whole bunch of pieces that just feel right separately to you and then just intuitively arrange them? Or do you have kind of a plan beforehand or what's that like? Uh, this is the first piece like this I've made on this scale, but I think I do try to create neat little compositions uh, for each section, which as you can see, aren't, aren't regular. That's the awesome thing about paper is the, um, you can change its shape in a moment. Um, uh, so I do try to work with that shape. I might decide to slice off a corner to make the composition better. Um, and then the working, the, the piecing the whole thing together did happen intuitively and organically. At the same time, I'm struggling with the size and the, way, the just the physical nature of it. So things that I want to happen don't always happen when gravity gets involved, um, which is exciting also. Yeah. And this piece is cool because it, you actually have a lot more pieces or a bunch more of pieces, larger pieces that you didn't send for this exhibition, but yes. this piece is really variable. They're back, they're behind you. Mm -hmm. um, it's really variable. So like in different locations, it could be in, in different iterations. Yeah, I feel really excited about that and excited to make more work like this that is, it will be different every time it's hung and maybe in a completely different arrangement. I did make this arrangement for art enables knowing which pieces were I could send, but um, it could look totally different next time. Yeah, that's exciting. It, it worked out really well. And I love that it has this kind of portal that, that people can peek through and kind of view the rest of the show, show through from the back end too. Cool. Well, thank you. Is there anything else um, you want to share before we move on? No, that's it. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Mariah. Okay, next up we have Helen Lewis, who's been a resident artist at Art Enable since 2017. Her artwork is both calm and jubilant, much like her spirit. She began her artistic journey as a fiber artist, but in the studio, her medium of choice is watercolor. 
Often using flowers as her inspiration, her work is continuously bright, colorful, and energetic. Helen has exhibited her work frequently in Washington, DC, as well as in group exhibitions around the country. And um, Helen will not be speaking on the call tonight, but when we asked her what she would like people to know about her work, she said she wants people to know that her work is usually colorful, which makes people happy, which is very true. Helen's work does make me happy. And um, you can check out more of her work on our website, lots more of her work. Okay, next we have, we're gonna take a look at Zach Manuel, who joined Make Studio in 2012. He brought with him a strong interest in comics, animation, and science fiction. A man with many goals in fine and digital art, Zach has diligently expanded his artistic repertoire beyond colored pencils and markers, which he still uses with great skill today, to become skilled in various media and techniques. He now draws his inspiration from animation as well as real life, and often weaves reflections about art making, dreams, emotional states, and his personal experiences of autism into his artwork. Zach is a graduate of the Harbor School in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, similarly, uh, Zach will not be speaking on the call tonight, but he did make a statement about his work, which I'll share with you. He said, my artwork is similar to a quilt because the patterns I drew are identical to the stitchings of yarn in a wool tapestry. There are even patterns within patterns. So it sounds like this piece was um, really directly inspired by a textile and you can see there are um, other shapes within shapes and overlapping and um, I really like that. I think he laid down maybe a wash of blue before um, drawing and painting over top of it. And I think it gives this piece a really beautiful tonality. So thanks to Zach and Make Studio for including his work in this show. Next, we have Craig Moran, who was born in Washington, DC and received his Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Studio Art at the University of Virginia. He received a fifth year arts fellowship at UVA and completed a post baccalaureate in painting and drawing at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Mr. Moran has lived in San Francisco and Chicago as well as various parts of Virginia. He currently resides in DC and has a studio in Tacoma Park. So Craig, um, it seems like you have a really, really prolific practice that is just chock full of these incredibly vibrant um, paintings and sometimes going a little bit more into the figurative but still kind of abstracted or reminds mm. me sometimes of like Kandinsky or even some like mm. uh, Dada art. Can, can you, um, what can you tell us about these pieces? Sure, well let me just give, give, give a, just a brief story about these. So a lot of these, well the, per, the one on the right actually started out several years ago when I had a series of paintings on paper. I didn't know what to do with them so I started just to cut, they were basically just abstract figures on paper, I oil paint on paper. So I cut out the figures from the paper and I just reassembled them um, in some way. In some, so what I did was I would just either reassemble them or just rearrange, or I would just put a stack of them one on top of the other. I would, remove, I would make a painting based on that stack and then remove a piece do a painting on that and just keep removing piece after piece until I got to like one piece. I wasn't sure exactly where this was going. At some point, what I did was I was going back and looking at stuff I had done in the past, all these paintings I had done. Frequently, what I would do is I would do close-ups that I would do is, as, well, as well as the actual piece. And then I just kind of, what I did was I would, I, I got the idea, I don't know how this happened. I don't know if it was because of what I was just describing with the, with the paint, with the, with the abstract figures on paper. But what I did was I just, I would, I printed out the close-ups and the, the photos on paper, on actual paper, printed them out, took a pair of scissors, just cut up, cut up the pieces and just laid them out on a, on a, on a larger piece of paper. And I just, I did, I don't know how many variations I did, like, you know, I just kind of get going and going. And so I also simultaneously, I would do this um, on imaging editing software like Photoshop. So I'm actually kind of comfortable doing both computer as well as that, the physical act of taking a pair of scissors and just cutting the stuff and just reassembling them. And I also, in addition to going, in addition to using, in addition to, Using previous uh, my previous paintings, I would also incorporate things like street art, like graffiti. Uh, I would spend also the I, the posters that what well, sometimes in construction sites you'll see like plywood sheets of plywood, and then people will put posters up. 
And like some, I, at one point, so a couple of years ago in my neighborhood, someone had put up these like these really colorful pop art type. I didn't know where they came from. So I, I started to kind of copy those. I would take pictures of those and then I would bring them into Photoshop and mix them up with my paintings. Like at one point I would take a, a, a graffiti tag and I would just sort of copy and paste that into Photoshop and then just move things around. And so, yeah. I think that's the one on the cool. left though, that doesn't really, um, that's, that's kind of different than the one on the right. But Wait, what was your process like for that one? Which one, the left one, one on the left? Yeah, the oh, one that on one was, Actually, that was, that's, that was also based on, that was actually based on a series of sketches that I did. And I, I didn't know what to do with it. I thought, well, I might as well just go ahead and try to translate these into paintings. and. I didn't really have anything in mind. I just, I like the idea of geometry and lines and color. There's certain colors that I'm used to. I, I kind of drawn to like reds and greens. And I like to, to also just kind of get, get like a lot of it, like emotion and movement in the painting. Yeah, I love that piece. Um, oh, by the way, it's not, I, light, it's, not, it's not light at the end of the tunnel, by the way. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. That's, oh, that's okay. That was, that's fine. That's all right. That was a copy paste error. That was right. that's not right. Molly's impression. <laughs> sorry about that. It's called burst. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just know that. Oh, long um, <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, that's um, okay. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting that um, I'm not trying to like make everybody's process be like quilt making, but um, yours mm -hmm. was one of the mm -hmm. statements too that um, it it did remind me a little bit of quilting in terms of all this like gathering and, and very much collaging, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but gathering all of these parts from all different places. And I like that you even remix your own work. I think that's interesting. There's like your own your own history in there too. Cool, well, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we move on? Um, no, I don't, think I, have, I don't think I have anything else to add. There was one okay. question in the comments uh, oh. for Craig, just uh, how, how you get your colors so vibrant, right? Um, <laughs> I just, uh, I, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I pick, I think it's primarily the, the, the primary colors like the cadmium reds and the cadmium yellows that um, they just, I, I think they're just the nature, they're just by nature, they're just, they're just happy, they're, um, bright, vibrant and bright. Only the brightest colors allowed Only in the brightest studio. Colors. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Craig. Sure, yeah. I love these pieces. Okay, next up we have Jamila Rahimi, who's been with Art Nable since 2006 and has shown work in more than 50 exhibitions. Her work shows off the diversity of her interests, showcasing her love for travel, baseball, and animals. Jamila brings her vibrant watercolors to life through densely constructed forms and an exceptionally patient and focused approach. She's incredibly thoughtful and always willing to sit down to chat, talk about her family, and share her excitement about upcoming events and activities. And um, Jamila also will not be speaking tonight, but um, you can see more of her work on our website, on her artist page. And um, I really love this piece of Jamila's. Uh, I think it's a, a great example of one of the things that happens sometimes in Jamila's work. She most often has these really beautiful um, colored shapes and to me, this piece feels almost like, like stained glass. I almost feel like there's light coming from behind this piece that, that's lighting up these colorful shapes. Um, but then she often does these uh, black marker outlines around the shapes to define them. And sometimes they're um, you know, just a little bit thick. They just sort of make things pop. And then sometimes they're like this, where they just sort of, they almost start to, to take over the, the colorful shapes, which I think is so interesting. And she just, she does them really methodically and precisely. You can see, it's not just flat black, you can see the movement of her, her circles outlining these here. Um, she's a really, really fascinating artist. So definitely check out more of her work on our site. Okay, next we have Lauren Rice, who is a visual artist based in Richmond, Virginia. She's exhibited her work in solo, collaborative, and group exhibitions at venues such as Cuchifritos Gallery and Project Space in New York City, Vox Populi, Philadelphia, Tiger Strikes Asteroid, New York City, Neon Heater, Finley, Ohio, ICA Baltimore, the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, Transformer in DC, and Spring Break Art Show in New York City, among many others. 
Bryce has been a fellowship artist at the Kella Art Institute in Berkeley, California, and an artist in residence at the Luminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Her work has been published in New American Paintings, Make Magazine, and Vast Magazine. Although rooted in painting, Bryce's recent works work takes the form of mixed media collage on paper and intersects with the worlds of drawing and sculpture. And um, these are a great example of pieces that are, are excellent to see in person, especially this piece on the left. There's just a lot of texture and layering going on here that you, you um, that the online images don't do it justice. Um, Lauren, what can you tell us about these works and your process? Well, thank you, Marissa. That was awesome. And thank you everybody at Art Enables. It's a real pleasure to be included in the show and very exciting. Um, yes, I agree the the images on the screen don't do the work justice. So go see them in person. Um, so um, I'm really bad at editing, Marissa. So I'm going to say some things um, in my three minute time slot. And then if you have more questions, let me know. Yeah, um, <laughs> so quilting has, has definitely been um, an influence of mine for a while. Um, it's something that I, I grew up around. My grandmother quilted. She made afghans. So this idea of like making things from a pattern, I think, you know, it, it made sense that it was going to eventually make its way into my work. My aunt is, a, is an avid quilter. Um, um, so I'm certainly a, a big fan of, of that read, but I was really excited about the idea of a mystery quilt, which I had not heard of until um, Marissa invited me to participate in the show, because there was something about it that really rang true to, to my process as an artist, where the end result is not necessarily known before I begin. I may have a vision, I may have some type of a vague plan, but um, it's very much of a, a, a back and forth between me and the work. Um, and the work is as much of a voice as I am, I feel sometimes. It, it often feels like a puzzle that I am working out, right? And then the, the puzzle pieces also are alive and kind of um, voicing their opinions. Um, so I thought that that was really exciting and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, so the scrap, um, the kind of leftover bits and pieces of paper that I use in my work have um, in the past year or so have become, I think, even more important. Um, the, I, I think that the work in on some level is this way of organizing these little bits of discarded uh, material um, to give them a second or a better life in this new arena. Um, and so I, again, I don't really know what the end result will be. Sometimes the scraps are, um, are discarded bits of old paintings that didn't work out. Sometimes they are um, things that I kind of make specifically to fit within um, a certain painting. So like Mariah said, failure and this kind of way of dealing with failure is certainly kind of built into my practice um, as well. So thank you. That's awesome. And I, I love that. Um, I mean, so you're repurposing some things that you maybe didn't in, always intend to, you didn't have a final destination for them, but it really gives a lot of your work um, such a history because there are all these like layers of things and maybe things that were happening in other pieces that are now in, um, in this new piece. And it's just, there's so much depth to them. Um, yeah. No, I agree. And there's, so there's this repetition in the pieces and then there's repetition as you look at all the pieces because you can kind of, if you look closely, you can kind of see or guess that certain things maybe came from the same um, painting originally. Cool. Yeah. And I liked, um, I think that this, this piece on the right, the maze is really fun. Uh, it's a really fun inclusion in this show. It has these, these pieces that are sort of more uh, maybe easily associated with quilts, but then it also all of these like loopy um, loopy things here sort of remind me of actual threads potentially, um, sort of intestinal threads connecting these these two like sections of quilt or something. Absolutely, um, I love that read. That's great. <laughs> um, I really love these works. Is there is there anything else you'd like to share? I think that's it. These pieces. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, next we have Kate Sable whose paintings of curvilinear and gridded abstract forms are an ongoing investigation between analytical and intuitive use of color, line, gesture, and shape. Recent exhibitions include a solo show at Pazzo Fine Art, Kensington, Maryland, Dream Journal, a three-person show curated by Alex Epstein at Goucher College, and a two-person exhibition at Equilateral Gallery in Los Angeles, curated by Sam Scharf. 
Her work is included in the spring issue of Art Maze magazine and the publication Friend of the Artist, and was also featured in the curatorial project Air and Space with the release Blurring All the Lines. Originally from Virginia, Sable earned a BFA from Virginia Tech and MFA from American University. She lives and works just outside DC, uh, so, yeah, in Reston, Virginia. <clears throat> Um, and Kate, I think that your works fit really beautifully into this show. Um, and one of the things that I like about your works is that they um, they have so much geometry going on in them, but they're also they also feel really organic and almost kind of fleshy in places. Um, what can you what would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, no, that's very interesting because I I think a lot about. Um, that sort of falling out of the fretwork of geometric abstraction and into more sort of, I would say, vulnerable organic material and letting the material fall and, and stay in containment and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm primarily an oil painter and through process-led abstraction, I use the material and that painting arena to really explore the tensions between the angst and the comical or the tender moments. And I'd say like a personal narrative, right? So I'm really driven by that search in the making process of a painting. And um, I use gesture, shape and color in, in a way that it can be in tune with sort of those, the complexity of that interpersonal relationship or that peculiar experience that I might be thinking about when I'm making a painting. And to echo what Lauren said, like I'm constantly never, I'm never clear of what the end result of the painting is gonna be. I have these like ideas that I kind of like, I think I know what I want, it's what the painting to become, but that idea is never as good as what I end up finding through the searching process. And so I think it's the finding is the thing that I love the most about it, about painting and, and about this process. And so um, I guess what I really love about the two pieces, Marissa, that you put together for to include in Mystery Quilt is that I guess it's the larger painting, Dream Hole is one of my newest paintings. Um, I think it, it may be one of the largest or, or the, the most recent larger painting that I had completed this past year. And the smaller one, Blow, is actually a, it's, it's a little older. It's not 2021. I think it's like 2018, maybe 2017. So it was actually, though, a really pivotal piece as I began exploring this sort of particular geometric construct by using fretwork, I guess, like as, as my container. And I hadn't really quite realized how similar, you know, the paintings were until you chose them for the show. So that was really kind of fun to experience. Um, after making Blow, I think the shapes within the paintings really started to evolve into more of like a, a vessel or a containment web, right? And so you can see how that's sort of happening in that early development is occurring within Blow. But you know, the, you know, the paint is often sitting within or it's seeping out of this organized space or piece. And I think that adds a layer of chaos or complexity to the compositions. And I've been exploring that a lot more lately when I'm doing the more recent work because there's just a little more containment and a little more spilling and that's kind of happening. But blow sort of feels like it, I think in talking about sort of this quilting loose theme or whatever, it feels more pieced together to me, which I, I, I think is really interesting. Although it wasn't, I think, purposeful necessarily, um, I'm not really actively thinking about quilting at all. Um, I do think a lot about touch in my work. And I think about a lot, I think a lot about how one shape can change in relation to what happens when it's sitting next to you know, another shape or if it's behind or if it's in front and all of those magical things that are happening while I'm making and I'm sort of like really pushing that energy of that exploration, that to me is interesting. And so I think as everyone's talking, it's neat to kind of hear the, the way that thread or that, that exploration or that use of line kind of ties a lot of us together in, in a cool way. So I was really excited to be included in the show. So thank you. Great, thanks, Kate. Yeah, and I, I, I really feel that sense of touch in your work. Um, I, it, it, it feels like the pieces are all like really, like I, you can see them kind of shifting or moving or pushing each other around. Um, and it does have a, have a really visceral feeling. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, um, next up we have Chris Schallhorn who is a fan of quilting and he creates the majority of his artwork by reinterpreting geometric designs that he sees in patterns. 
Every step that Chris takes is planned and measured ahead of time. This process makes his work especially popular with those mathematically minded people who enjoy the repetition in his art. Chris is also a jokester at heart and enjoys having fun with his fellow artists. He's been a resident artist at Art Enables for over 15 years since 2005 and has exhibited his work frequently in the DC area as well as nationally. Um, Chris will not be speaking on the call tonight, although I hope he is here, but he did take some time recently to talk with us about his work. And I'm gonna to try to share a short two minute video of that with you now. Um, Tony uh, Brunswick, if you could just like give me a thumbs up if while I'm playing this, you can hear it. Um, I think you should be able to. This triangle is mostly from a uh, quilt pattern that was, that I cut out of plastic. Oh, really? And it's called the pinwheel. It's, once I made that pinwheel thing, then I could use those triangles for, for any other use or anything. So you sort of like got inspired by those shapes and then you keep reusing them in different ways? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard for me. I have to sit down, take a ruler and figure out what I'm gonna, how I'm gonna change, chop it, change it. Yeah, rearrange stuff. Yeah. I really don't know what, what's gonna, how it's gonna turn out. So it's sort of like, kind of fun to discover it as you're going? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the, Charlene did, did one kind of got some of her pictures. Yeah, and she's, she has a work right over here. You and see her piece? She, and she, um, so I, so I went and started, I just did the dots. So you were inspired by Eileen's work? I was inspired by her little dots. Her dots, yeah. She's got dots in this piece, do you see this piece? Because she was, because, yeah, I mean, she's, I mean, just to fill it in, and that's what you need to do. Yeah, that was paint, but the little, the marker that we, that we have. Is, it, is there anything that you would like people to know about your work, or that you want to talk about about your work? Not really, you just have to, they have to come and look at it and decide if they really <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks to Chris for talking with us about his work. And you can see more of his work on our website also. So next up we have Eileen Schofield, who has also been a resident at artist at Art Naples for over a decade, exhibiting her work at Art Naples and other galleries and spaces around the country. Using markers, her medium of choice for her vibrant drawings, Eileen is able to achieve a level of density and color saturation that lends itself to her bold, joyful work. Eileen is a DC resident, and in addition to her prolific practice at Art Naples, she also works steadily to help fulfill the artistic needs of L'Arche, Greater Washington, DC. So Eileen, um, thanks for being here. Um, I know I just said that you, you do often work with markers, but um, this is an example of one of your painted pieces on canvas. And um, you often work um, more figuratively where you're drawing specific things like trees or animals or buildings. But this is an example of a piece that's more abstract with shapes. Um, what can you tell us about this piece? Um, it, it, I named that one Blue. Blue Sky. Yeah, Blue Skies. And why'd you name it that? Because it got blue, orange, and a little bit of green, and, and pink. Does it make you think of a sky at all? Were you thinking about clouds or something like that while you were working on it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think, I hope you heard Chris in his video talking about how he was inspired by the dots that you used in your work that you mm -hmm. use sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, um, I really like that you use the dots in this piece. Um, it adds a lot more texture to it and it really feels like the canvas is really filled up. It's all, all the pieces are sort of packed in there, especially with those dots touching them. Um, what else would you like to tell us about this work or your work in general? Um, I, I, I like it. 
You like it? I like it too. I love it. Yeah. Um, I think it works really well in this show too. Um, what kind of things do you like to work on the most in your artwork? I like to work on uh, putting some more dots around my work. You like doing that? Yeah. And so, like I was saying before, sometimes you make drawings of specific things like trees or animals, but then this piece isn't really of something specific. It's, it's abstract shapes. Does it feel different to you to work on a piece like this than to make like a drawing of a lion, for example? Do you like working this way? Yeah. Does it, how does it feel different to you to work with just shapes rather than drawing something specific? Cause um, I like, I like drawing shapes the, the best. You like, do you like drawing things like this the best? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit more of like a free form activity for you when you don't have to try to draw something really specifically. Yeah. Yeah. And in your work, um, which is always so bright and colorful, I think even when you are drawing something like a tree, it's very Eileen. Um, it's very, it is made up of interesting shapes um, itself too, in a way that is, is very specific to you. Do you have anything else you'd like to tell us about your work? Um, is that one going to be sold? I hope so. It's um, it's still hanging in the show, but somebody could still buy it. Yeah. So we'll have to see. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Eileen. Thanks for being here. Okay. 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 Next up, we have Margie Smeller who has honed her craft over many years working on commissions at home, exhibiting her work in solo shows and as part of a collective with the Artist Gallery in Frederick, Maryland, as well as previously via uh, working with Scott Key Center in Frederick, Maryland, and actually also with Art Nables in the past. Margie loves writing poetry, often in tandem with her visual artwork. She draws inspiration from a vast array of sources, including pop film and National Geographic. She's also a talented athlete competing in varied sports, including skiing and kayaking. Margie is an artist at Make Studio in Baltimore, Maryland and lives in Mount Airy, Maryland. And Margie um, will not be speaking on the call tonight, but she did share a statement about her work. She said, my work is like a quilt because I always try to use the whole sheet of paper. And a lot of what I draw is in patterns. Also, my mom is a quilter. So um, she's one of several artists um, in the show that have a relative who's a quilter, which I think is cool. And this piece feels to me um, like it has its own kind of internal mechanics almost, like there are all these little planes, these little like diamond planes that feel like they're connected by the, the longer, skinnier shapes and the little uh, circles in there. And I almost feel like you could take it and like shape it into something like one of those toys from like a, a museum shop or something. Um, I think it's, it's really fantastic. So thanks to Margie and Make Studio. And then last but definitely not least is Mark Fakela. He is a Washington DC based visual artist. He holds a BA in graphic design from the American University in DC and attended the Yale University program for graphic design in Brazago, Switzerland. Mark has worked as a graphic designer and an art director for 25 years in Seattle and DC. And his art has been exhibited in Washington, Washington DC, Virginia, and New York. And so Mark is going to talk to us about his work. We're gonna switch over to a different camera in a second. And then we're going to just seamlessly transition into our workshop portion. Um, Mark will be leading the workshop after that. So um, give us just a second and we'll be ready to go. I can't tell if I'm up. Oh, there I am. Hello. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how seamless I can do this. Uh, I just want to say first, like everyone else, um, thank you. I'm really proud to be a part of this show and with uh, included with so many talented artists. Uh, I think I'll, I'll start by talking about the piece um, behind me and on your screen. Uh, this is something I made um, for Art Truck Arlington, or I should say with Art Truck Arlington. And it seemed like such a good fit for the show because its process seemed a lot like quilting. Um, I went around Arlington with Cynthia Connolly at the art truck 
And we identified some old signage from around Arlington that would help kind of tell the story of the history of Arlington. I made some small squares uh, by chopping those signs up. And then we made a pile of like 700 different colored tiles that people could come and sit with us at a little tent we set up at events and compose uh, a, a, a rectangle of abstract type form um, into a piece of art, I guess you call it. So, I, you know, this piece to me seemed to go so well with this show because uh, not that I've ever done any quilting, but I'd love to, it's, it's process seems so similar to it, even to possibly the community part of it where we were all sharing these same squares and chatting while we were uh, assembling them and coming up with compositions. It was interesting to me too, because I had been, uh, this is all came from a design project that I, I learned at AU from a teacher named Marjorie Hirano, where we took some headlines from magazines and newspaper and cut them into squares and had to come up with a composition from that. And having, let's say, doing that for like 25 years before I even did the the art truck project with Cynthia, it was amazing to me sitting around with people and discovering all the ways I hadn't bought to do it or all the new things people brought to it that in all my time I had never come up with. So it kind of you know, fed me, I guess you'd say. Uh, some of the themes that came out of that that a lot of people mentioned, you know, the joy of making something out of reclaimed materials, maybe materials that were headed for the trash and the ability to turn that into something functional or useful or beautiful. Um, I think like other artists talked about it, it's, it's fun to discover what's gonna happen while it's going on. It's a active process and a give and take. You're always reacting to something you put down and making changes and it kind of never ends that way or it's a, it's a self-sustaining mechanism for generating compositions or something. Um, uh, somebody said earlier, there's a certain kind of gathering going on too, which uh, much like when Cynthia and I went around looking for the, the things we would assemble in a lot of my work, it's, you know, a lot of the pieces are come up from, from walking around the city and finding newspaper, seeing signage or things like that. So in a way it's connected to my environment because it's made of some of the same visual vocabulary of that environment. Um, another thing that I heard tonight that was really uh, great uh, was the, it's really important failures um, because so much of this is, it's not like you're trying to recreate something that you can say, yes, I've made it. You, you never know when it's done. So it's a constant exploration and, and it's you know, through all those failures sometimes too, you make, make some of the biggest steps you've ever made at going in a new direction or developing new ways of thinking about it. Um, I guess that's really all I can say about this piece for now, other than, you know, I think uh, the great thing about this is in making things like this is it's all in the eye of the viewer. And uh, it, it, there's never a wrong sort of answer to how these things are being composed. It's just the exploration. I guess I should just seamlessly go into now maybe a uh, globe coaster and some of the other things. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in or ask any questions. So I will just do that. Um, before we get into maybe making uh, or doing a little assignment tonight, I'll, I'll talk about my process in general and maybe Marissa, it would be, we could go to those slides now. Okay, great. <laughs> so um, I grew up in Baltimore and, and then came to school here in DC in 1989. And um, one of the things that was always around in the environment was uh, Globe Posters. The poster company that started in Baltimore in the 30s, I have a piece of one here. And these used to be all over, uh, you know, uh, boarded up buildings on 14th Street. I used to live at 14th and T. And on my walk home from the Metro, I would you know, take these scraps down from uh, the billboards they were up on. I was always just so enamored by the bright colors and the glow posters. So I, they sort of were like begging to be worked with and maybe brought inside in a way. As on my walks home, I was just 
so enamored and interested in and pulled to those old walls covered in ripped up posters and all the sort of information and history that was kind of implied in it. So anyway, I started collecting those posters and I then started cutting those into, I don't know how well you guys can see this, a little like two inch squares. So then this just became my composition making machine. And if I would go to a, I would take the train to New York, let's say to visit friends, I would just put the tray table down and pull these out and start arranging and composing into things. And as you can see here in the slideshow, uh, these are a couple of the first pieces I made. Um, they're sort of like one-to-one -one recreations of these globe collages. I guess you could even call them quilts. Um, and actually, the, so the image on the right, you can see that's a seven by 10 foot painting I made from a collage that was seven by 10 inches and just made out of those um, cut shapes that I found. Um, with that, and I guess you can go to the next slide now. Um, again, same process, uh, what you're seeing up top is the actual collage that I made with my little pieces as I was taking the train. And that ended up eventually being a mural for uh, the DC Public Library for their temporary fab lab that they had set up in MoMA. So I guess I'm just trying to show you a, a way that I apply the process to some of the projects that may have come in. Um, I get you can keep going, Marissa. And also I, I started doing some silk screens from those just, I. I Typically, I just like to make stuff in general. So I, I like to paint. I like to collage. I like to make silk screens. I hope to make a quilt one day. I guess we'll see where all this goes. But this process of, of kind of chopping up and rearranging has always been a part of it. And to me, it's really neat how far a very simple process taught to me in a design class, which was just take a headline and make some squares and cut shapes and create an abstract piece from that. And I've been, you know, dining off that now for 30 years. Um, so on the left, you can see uh, up the top, again, like sort of a one-to-one -one, um, collage where it's just those glow pieces and, and, and an arrangement I like that I made into a six color collage. And then beneath that, you can see another silk screen I've made. And this is one that came from the process of, you know, other people talked about this. Is, uh, going back to other work you've done in the past, you may have seen it as a mistake or it just didn't go somewhere you'd like. And I would return to that and start chopping it up. I would look at you know, individual uh, screens that print out and maybe develop a painting from that, but almost like the process just keeps feeding itself and growing. It never gets more complicated in itself, but the works to produce maybe appear to become more complicated, but it's really just the same thing put to work. Um, you can go to the next slide now. Um, same continuing here, the one on the left is literally a, a chopped up silk screen. So it's, it's you know, interesting to me that it would go from found paper to collage, to silk screen, to chopped up paper, to collage, and then this be could become a painting or who knows what. I guess as time goes on, we'll see where it takes me. And then uh, the example on the right, and I heard someone talk a little bit about this before. Um, uh, one of the, the tools in my arsenal is definitely the computer. So I will make these collages out of these little things, take photos of them, bring them into the computer, print that out, cut it up, maybe bring that into the computer, bring it into Photoshop, print that out, cut it up. So again, the same process, just taken to extremes to produce new kinds of imagery. Uh, you can go ahead again, Marissa. Uh, these are some paintings I made from the, the things and, and you can see me kind of maybe breaking away or trying to hide some of the square grid, never wanting to leave it sort of entirely. I maybe like that underlying structure because it, uh, when you're working with that abstract, uh, maybe it gives the viewer kind of a comfort level in that structure. And I know I like it. Um, like a lot of the, the artists that talked before too, I'm attracted to really saturated and bright colors. Um, and I hope you're seeing that through this work. 
uh, and that kind of comes from the globe posters themselves and that they were made of those day glow colors. Uh, I'm probably trying to mimic some of that brightness. Um, you can go ahead again. Now, these are some pieces I did a while ago when I was taking my collages and working on pattern. And uh, when Marissa first reached out to me, I, I thought for sure that these were the pieces she had in mind um, because, uh, you know, they feel in a lot of ways very similar to quilts or I guess at least textiles and their patterning. Um, and it was while I was working on these that I decided at some point in my life, I'm probably gonna have to try to make a quilt. Uh, I love the, the, the functionality of quilts, especially uh, paintings are great and everything, but they can't make you warm necessarily, <laughs> literally. So it would be really neat to one day apply some of this uh, some of this process to something like the quilt, you know, the, the found nature of it, the, the reclaiming old material nature of it, um, the turning something that was headed for the trash into something that might be loved and used and functional. Um, all of those things are really attractive to me and to, you know, it's attractive to me possibly to use, um, you know, what can we use besides paint um, you know, what can we find around us that's headed for the trash and how can we turn that into things and any kind of projects or at home crafting that would encourage us to think about what we're throwing away and how it could be used again. I think there's a real kind of benefit to that in the world. Um, I guess we can go to the next slide. I think we might be kind of, so then Marissa had a, a great idea of possibly using a um, cereal box for this project. And it, it seems like something a lot of people could have at home. Um, it checks the box of a lot of bright colors. It checks the box of color next to color, not, not just color sitting on a white field. And so I went and bought a Reese's Puffs cereal box, made sure I ate the whole thing quickly, and then uh, took it apart um, just with a ruler. And I can kind of do this here while we're talking about it too. A ruler and a pencil and um, some scissors. I just gritted up my box like I'll do here in front of you. You can go to the next slide too, Marissa into, and most inches are probably about an inch wide, or most rulers are probably about an inch wide, uh, to get these inch long squares, just as simply as this. Um, you can go on to the next slide. After gritting up my box, I would just take a piece of scissors. You can use a, um, a, an exacto blade if you feel safe doing that, and you got a chaperone. Um, uh, you can use a paper cutter, whatever works best for you to create squares that are as similar in size as possible to one another, essentially. Um, after I've gone and, and cut those all up, Marissa, you can go to the next slide. I start to identify the, the shapes that are probably most appealing to me. In the photo, you can see I've kind of split some into that yellow and orange with the, with the brown outline type that I'm most interested in into a, a big pile as I'm doing kind of here again. Um, I got little blue pieces. I've got all, the, all those things. This is kind of sort of like my, my, my paint palette. These, this is the, these are the colors I get to work with and the forms I get to work with for this particular task. Um, you can probably go to the next slide. And here you'll see one that I just you know banged out at home while uh, I was prepping for the talk. Um, and you know I'm not sure how fun all these are to you, but I could spend days doing this stuff. And you know, like this photo you're seeing here, as I'm as I'm doing these collages, I'm just taking photos with my camera as a record because I'm just going to break this all down and assemble it again. Um, I have to say that I like that nature of it too, that non-permanence and this idea that I'm just generating compositions, recording it with a little note and saving my data and then moving on. And then over time, I, I have this huge library of sketches that I can return to anytime I wanna make a painting. Um, another thing I do, um, uh, I think we're kind of done with the slideshow. I don't know if they can make me bigger on the screen, but I might, uh, let's say as I'm assembling, um, and I'll just work out one real quick here. 
and I encourage all of you to try this later. Um, it can it can occupy your mind for a long time. I think somebody said earlier. I may have already said it. It's like a puzzle that I'm trying to work out. I think it was Lauren, but there's no answer to the puzzle. You don't know what the final solution is. Uh, so it, uh, it's something that really activates your mind and gets you thinking in some neat ways. Ways lines come together, the way forms come together. Um, so anyway, I might assemble a quick sketch, we'll call it like this. Um, and then I might take a, a piece of plexi or glass that I have and lay it over top of my thing. This would allow me to kind of show it off. It would also allow me to then take a piece of tracing paper and possibly lay it on top of this, make my tracing to get a nice line drawing. I can kind of drop the color off of this. And then I might go and make four or five other sketches at this proportion just to come up with four or five more of these tracings at this proportion. And then I might lay all of those on top of one another and create a new tracing from that and a new composition and a new way to go from there. But again, like just this, idea that it's always generating the next thing if you just keep exploring this really simple process. Um, another thing I made, I, I was lucky to connect with the people, I should say, so back to those globe posters, um, Micah, uh, Maryland Institute College of Art, actually bought the or acquired the, the globe presses when globe closed, I think at the end of the 90s. Um, so they teach classes on those presses now and globe posters are still being made. I was fortunate that she sent me some of their scraps at one point and I just made this little composition making machine <laughs> for myself here. Uh, again, you know, the same process, just another way to kind of think about composition, to play with color. Again, it's not permanent. It's just a sketch making machine. But um, hopefully you can see from this simple little demonstration that, uh, you know, a very simple collaging process and some dedication can take you a long way as far as, uh, you know, complexity of compositions and things. Uh, I would love if anyone had any questions because I don't know really what else to say. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Mark. Um, I, uh, I maybe you want to mute your your computer for a second while I'm talking. We can switch off. I think there's a little bit of an echo. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing this. I think this is such a great process. It's so accessible to to really anybody, and it's a great tool for artists too to just like experiment and play. It's very forgiving, like you said. It's like you're not making a permanent mark on a paper. You can just keep rearranging and keep playing. Um, if anybody on the call, uh, has been doing it on the call or you're going to, please do email us your pictures of your work. We'd love to see it. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, a May asks, are those blocks wooden with paper glued to them or are they a brick of paper? Oh, guys, sorry. I think that the his our phone died. That was filming him. He said they are wooden blocks. <laughs> I'll translate. Yeah, he said that they are wooden blocks from Amazon that he glued these papers to. Um, and um, people are saying that they love your process, Mark. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Mark or comments or anything you want to share that you can drop in the chat? If so, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, okay, well, I think, especially since the camera died, I think we're um, nearing the end of our event. Um, thanks so much to everybody for being here. Thank you so much to our amazing artists. Um, it's such an honor to work with all of you. Uh, like I said, please do come visit us in person. Again, we're open all day from nine to five and that's through June 19th for this show. Um, we also have another artist talk on Tuesday for our, uh, another concurrent exhibition called Actually I'm From the Suburbs, I Just Say DC Because It's Easier, which is a full gallery installation, which is also on view now. Um, so please come back and, and join us again next week too. And um, yeah, I think that about wraps it up. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. Yeah, thanks. Bye.